Here's one for you, OP. A while back, my store had what we called the Tower Alliance. Seven different Tower players who would pull together resources and money, work together in epic games, etc. At the time, there were three Imperium players me, my buddy who ran IG, and a guy who ran Grey Knights off and on. Now the store owner was a cool guy, would set up some nice themed games for us, and one of them always ended up being Tau the Imperium of Man, so we had to represent. We got stomped every time. Up, they had Mantas. Three of them. On top of just about every flyer that could be had, we were outnumbered points wise sometimes 4 to 1. We would get a fuck ton of planetary ground based defenses to make up for it, but it was never enough. All battles ended with us being slaughtered almost to the man, but we gave as good as we got, planned and plotted, and made every inch of ground costly. One week, the store owner threw us a bone. Unbeknownst to me, the Imperial Guard player had recently purchased Creed, and the store owner had made a deal to lend the Imperial Guard player his three Warhound Titans to use in an IA formation. I on my own, had pulled out the stops. The game we were going into was an invasion type scenario, where the Imperium was mastering its forces to deny the Xenofilth a key comms tower. The comms tower battle was going to be a battle within a battle, a standard 40k battle within a larger APEC battle, with APEC force allotments. To wit, I brought in my secret weapon, 50 terminators that I had gained over time from other people selling their armies of various configurations. All of whom would be keyed into defensive locations around the tower, essentially a big square loaded with defenses. I planned to dig my heels in and dare the TAU scum to take it from me. Our battle plan was to be sneaky as fuck. Force the Tau players down streets and alleys to limit the rush. Deny them safety of JSJ. Bombard units when we could and use hydras and point defense guns to bring down the fast flyers. Then have SM infantry and fast attack come in to isolate, outflank, and crush individual squads outright. It worked, sorta. While the Mantas were weathering the storm, their flyers were dropping from the skies, and our outflankers were coming strong due to the comms tower. We surrounded and ground crisis suits to paste, Bassies shelling the ones we could not envelope in murderous crossfire. They came back strong taking out tanks and pills boxes, jumping out of ambushes, SM dying in the droves. Then they came for the comms tower, after taking two of the game's five objectives on the far edge of the map. I was waiting for them. Every person that ever said vanilla termies weren't worth a shit would have shut their traps. The xeno trash fell upon my bunkers and metal boxes, and they burned and died in ignoble repute the way they should have. Bolters, Askens, Cyclones flared, or Tosent's building defenses came to life. Dice were flying, fire warriors, suits, devilfish were dropping, I couldn't hide my grin as they walked a certain doom. Then, the goddamned manta came overhead. Now, for everyone that has never dealt with a manta, they are considered a transport, an oversized, upgun transport. It dropped some 40 crisis suits right into the square, bypassing my frontline defenses. Imagine Lord of the Ring, Battle of Helm's Deep, when the deeping wall was blown up. It was like that. I pulled land speeders from other battles in a desperate attempt to shore up my defenses, but it was too late. They were all over me, plasma and flamers hitting my entrenched termies, manta bringing down fire on any support from friendly skimmers and flyers. Hell, the best I could hope for was that when they went down, they crashed into the suits ripping me to pieces. My Imperial Guard buddy couldn't even support me, because due to the way the square was constructed, tanks couldn't get in, and the Bassies needed to keep fire up on his end just to stay on the level. While I used the wrecks of his Russes to give cover to my SM, I finally made the decision to surrender the now overrun comms tower to the Xeno Menace, but they would not have. I had my few remaining Termias escape the square, and directed my Imperial Guard buddy to shell the tower, using my last land speeder as a spotter. The tower went down in a full epoch explosion, taking out all Tau forces in the square, the land speeder and three of my remaining eight termies on top of damaging the Manta. Ave Imperator, Mythurfica. After that, shit went downhill in a hurry. I didn't expect the fools to devote an entire Manta to taking the square, and it was only by the blessing of he upon his throne that the Manta in question dropped its entire payload. Losing said payload and was damaged in the effort, losing many of its guns. We began to pull back, my SM leaving behind squads and buildings to harry Tau forces and buy time. At this point, the Tau alliance was in full gloat mode, smiles, drinks and bro fists abound. They took the time to kill each individual squad I had left behind to a man. Slowly moving up the mantas to recover suits to drop later and shelling buildings to rubble if the occupants proved stubborn. 
My buddy's sentinels were getting greased by the ton, and for two turns, we got our shit handed to us. The only good thing to come about was my LR terminus dropping one of the mantas, the sanctum of peace, causing it to come down hard, losing nearly all of the suits and troops on board and killing a score of ground troops. Chill guy, it gets better. It was turn 5, or 6, don't remember. The ass kicking was going in full swing. Losing the manta and the troops enraged the tower and was a heavy shot of morale for the imperial forces. We were skirmishing with them, using units to draw them out in their bloodthirsty anger, a game surrounding and crushing them, but we had neither the numbers nor might to continue it. Finally, the reserve roll. I remember that moment. My buddy's eyes lit up, he had the biggest grin I've ever seen on a man that wasn't on my own face, and with one word, changed the fate of the battle. Creed and the owner brought out three Warhound Titans and plonked them on the flank. Commenced jaw dropping, yelling, arguing, while my buddy lit up a cigarette. I expected him to say you mad, Zeno scum. It was glorious beyond compare. In a single salvo, they dropped a manta in a epic explosion, killing so many guys I didn't bother to count the models and nearly bringing the other manta out of the air. The next salvo eliminated almost all the suits that were assaulting out front line. In subsequent turns, we surged forth, Russes lumbering out, tongue shocking whatever could be reached after blowing warriors away, I embarking all the remaining SM I had on transports and pushing forward. We took back the square, we took back the barracks and slaughtered the tower that were in it, tanks threw fire and death and the titans reigned supreme over the battlefield. Uncontested lords among children, the Tau quailed with fear and fled before the might of man in its full brilliance, the last manta retreating far to the rear, leaving behind men of fire warriors and suits with no cover or safety. No mercy ask and none given. We took back almost the entire city in one fell, unstoppable wave, pushing the Tau to the last objective they held. Held they did, at that, their courage not failing them at the end. They struck back as only a cornered beast can, throwing themselves upon us like wolves. The manta surged forward, and in a final act of defiance, levied all its remaining weapons on the titans. Felling one in an explosion that killed many on both sides before being felled by the remaining titans and the combined might of the tanks and raiders we possessed. But did the five remaining terminators from, make it out alive or were they casualties of the advancing tau onslaught? Because if they survived, oh my holy fuck if they survived, they should be showered with awards, praise, imperium wide tours of fame. But they wouldn't want that. Number. They'd just want their next mission. They'd want to get back to their chapter and continue pushing forward. Because they're marines, they are built for one thing. Terminators have a piece of the emperor's armor in them. They can't let him down, because he is always with them. For the emperor. Of the five, four survived. Two astermies with TLC and two vanilla with cyclone and PW. I was proud and they were decorated appropriately. The battle continued for a bit more, before the last suits were destroyed and the last fire warriors run off. The battle concluded, we counted up the casualties. I personally lost 44 terminators, 64 space marine, 4 tech marines, 4 rhinos, 3 razorbacks, 4 land raiders and 9 land speeders. In a point game that was 7-9k imperial and almost 29k tau, we won handily. They are gone now, the tower lands, of the group. Three are left, and only one plays regularly. Never had a battle like that before, likely never will again. It was a good game, the defining game of my 40k days, and I'm happy that I could have it. I'll carry it fondly for the rest of my life, I think. Ave Imperator, Anon, signing off. They are gone now, the Tower Lance. Did their humiliating defeat play some part in that, by any chance? No, it was school, money issues, real life, for the most part. It did lead to infighting, and I know at least one of the guys was bitter towards the store owner about it. Not only did you win the battle with your epic moment of creed, you also broke the spirits of the generals. This is what a true imperial hero is. <laughs> Player 1 white shirt, henceforth called wheels is a Warhammer power gamer. His gimmick is to hold his entire army in reserve. The opponent will be forced to deploy conservatively, since wheels side of the field will be empty. At the beginning of his first turn, Wheels will deploy his entire force in a compact spearhead, then advance and pierce the enemy line at its weakest point. Player 2 Black Shirt, let's call him Shooter is aware of Wheels gimmick, a Chaos Klubsda. During the normal deployment setup phase, Shooter places his commander on the field. In Warhammer, two players are supposed to take turns, deploying and counter-deploying until everything is on the field. 
However, Wheels announces that he's deploying nothing. He'll hold his entire force in reserve as he planned all along. Shooter places a row of scouts into a single thin skirmish line covering Wheels' entire edge of the table. Scouts can be deployed anywhere, but anti-cheese rules prevent him putting a scout within 30 centimeters of an opposing unit, but there are no opposing units anywhere on the field and so the rule is moot. Tactically, these scouts are fucked, they have no cover, no support, and they are on open ground. As soon as the opposing cavalry takes the field, these guys will die. The deployment phase ends. It's now Wheels turn. Shooter informs him that the game is over. Wheels can't actually deploy any of his motorcycles. Anti-cheese rules prevent him from placing a reserve unit within 5 cm of an enemy model there isn't a single 5 cm gap anywhere on Wheels edge off the field. Wheels entire force is doomed to sit uselessly in reserve until the game ends, at which point he'll lose automatically because Shooter controls the entire map. The tournament officials declared that Shooter's interpretation of the rules was technically correct and granted him the victory. And now you know why Shooter is smiling while Wheels is poring over a rulebook. I posted this story on a 40k board I frequented back in the day. Figured I'd copy it over here. Long posting coming. When I was 15 and in high school there was a guy that came to our club who we'll call Trainwreck Mike. At this point it's probably unnecessary to say that Mike was not well liked. This was not without good reason, because Mike was a huge asshole. When I say he was the weird angry kid, that's a misleading understatement. It carries the connotation that Trainwreck Mike had been produced by a set of conditions that might grant someone an excuse in life. Mike had no excuse. He had a perfectly decent, financially stable, family that I knew through the community, one that had produced two other perfectly decent children, and yet he was childish, mean-spirited, comically lazy, aggressively racist homophobic, and prone to tantrums and violent outbursts. He had no friends that I was aware of, and yet somehow ever present on the fringe of several social circles. He was the kid who showed up to parties uninvited and got the police called because he drank too much and became wildly violent. He was the kid who would pull up a chair at your lunch table, and then refuse to leave when asked yet continually try to include himself in your conversation. He was the kid who constantly threatened other students and teachers with lawsuits on behalf of his lawyer father. He was the kid who flipped weekly between styling himself as a cool bro stoner, and actually trying to report kids he suspected of smoking. Despite the fact that he was aggressively insulting to others, most frequently to overweight girls, I believe he honestly viewed himself as a victim of bullying and social persecution. He was that guy. If you've encountered a large enough slice of humanity, you've probably met one. I'm sorry for both of us. Mike, for whatever reason, liked Warhammer. He wasn't very good at Warhammer and became very angry whenever he started to lose. At best this would have been funny, at worst annoying, if not for Zack Smith. Zack was the 13 year old younger brother of John Smith, my friend. He was also the only openly gay person at our gaming club. Mike ragged on Zack for being gay constantly. It was never anything terribly creative, just urging him to kill himself. Extensive vulgar questions about gay sex that a 13 year old doesn't need to think about etc. The persistence to which he took to the task would have been admirable under other circumstances. In some nights it would result in him shouting across the room as Zack was trying to play magic with his friends. I think the enmity was fueled in part by Trainwreck Mike's apparent obsession with John's girlfriend, but I think it was mostly that he thought chasing away the gay kid would gain him standing with us somehow. The situation was further complicated by the fact that the old lady who ran and operated our hobby store was friends with Mike's grandmother, and while I think she understood he was disliked, she seemed to think he had special issues and was reluctant to hear ill of him. We'd go to her with reports of bullying, she'd take him aside, and then come back and sympathetically convince one of us to play a match against him. It became so annoying that no one would deal with Mike, that people stopped coming to the hobby store. There were still customers, but it stopped being a hangout for a lot of the regular crowd. John, myself, and our group of Warhammer players sort of mutually decided that we wouldn't be driven out. It was partly convenience, it's hard to play Warhammer without good tables and a terrain collection, but it was also in our minds a defiant stand for what was right. It all started when John freehanded daisies on the shields of all his high elf spearmen, and dubbed them the Rainbow Brigade. His brother no longer came to the club, but in a show of support had endeavored to give his army a gay pride theme. As always, Mike came to club, played with the unpainted army he had recently purchased off eBay I think Skaven, and lost. The entire game he had been insulting John's faggy elves, 
seemingly not understanding that the aesthetic was intentional. All John had to do was repeatedly point out how badly Mike was being beaten by a bunch of queers, and it sent him into a larger fit than usual. By the end of it, he was literally in tears, and by the next Wednesday every single army at the club had at least one model that was out, proud, and loud. There was a defiler covered in glitter and Mardi Gras beads, an orc carrying a rainbow standard, a space marine sergeant with crimson lips and wig of barbie hair super glued to his head, and several more loudly colorful models. My contribution was Lieutenant Fab. I don't know where the model has gotten to in the intervening decade, so all I have is this picture of him off my old workbench. The LT was a basilisk crewman who had been given striped lavender trousers and a thin wash of glittery nail polish. He was a true son of mankind and literally sparkled with the Emperor's light. From the first game the LT took his post, the basilisk he crewed seemed to become uncannily accurate, scoring hits on the scatterdiss at least half the time. Anytime the basilisk was choosing a target John would come over and dictate his internal monologue, choosing to portray him as a very swishy gay man who just loved killing Xenos. We were 15, and this is perhaps not as funny in retrospect as it was at the time, but the important thing is that Mike hated it. So after a few weeks of everyone else in the store roundly beating Mike at Warhammer, it became my turn to play him. He was rolling a Tyranid list circa 2005, so warrior spam backed up by lots of little bugs. My IG picked up the first turn and the basilisk managed to maintain its uncanny accuracy, immediately acing a squad of poorly deployed lictors. Mike was very upset by this, a condition made worse by John's narration of the LT's arousal. After a few more turns of devastating guard ordnance Mike finally got one of his carnifexes in shooting range of the basilisk. It's important to understand that Trainwreck had a habit of talking to and threatening his models when he wanted them to perform. So on the start of his shooting phase he declares to his carnifex you're going to roll a 6 now or I'll tear your feying arms off. He failed to roll a 6, and then tore its feying arms off. Everyone was generally speechless. Trainwreck Mike had snapped into a new level of crazy and nobody quite knew what to make of it for a moment. Until John came over, handed me a large blast template and said, just skip your movement phase. Put the next one right here. He pointed to a particularly dense cluster of warriors and gaunt sandwiched between two buildings. I responded something to the effects of, I'm gonna need some astroglide to fit a shell in between all those bases. John picked up the lieutenant, wiggled him next to my ear, and in high falsetto sang, I I I've got some. Mike just starts kicking the underside of the table. The boards we used were actually pretty heavy, so this wasn't too effective. After knocking a few models onto their side, he turned to the row of empty tables behind him and just starts kicking them over one after the other. He's screaming, not saying anything, but just literally screaming ee ha 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 He got through dominating three tables before the owner lady comes in and, louder than I've ever heard her, screams, you, out. Now, I'm going to call the police. Get out. I wish I could say I never saw Trainwreck Mike again. In fact I saw him the next day in school and he approached our lunch group as if nothing had happened, taking this particular social catastrophe with the same forgetful equanimity as the rest. He remained a fixture of my high school years, not quite as far in the background as one would like, until graduation. He did however never return to our game store, and though adult me is not entirely proud of how we chose to deal with him, I still take small satisfaction in our toppling the despot whose tantrums ruled our space. Too long didn't read Robot 9000 didn't exist in 2005 and Robert sometimes played Warhammer in public. Was that Chris Chan in the last story? Like, seriously, like, you know, that, that, that was exactly how I imagine Chris Chan got on, like, in the games place. Like, you know, like, okay, so if you don't know who Chris Chan is somehow, check out my video. I did a quick video on Chris Chan a wee while back. Definitely go ahead and check that out. It covers quite a bit, but not everything. Chris Chan's one of those types of people you just peel back, 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 and it just keeps going. There's always something new to learn about Chris Chan. I'm not even taking the piss. But, like, you know, oh, like, you know, let's face it, we've all, like, why is it so common in 40k? Well, not even just 40k, but, like, you know, everyone comes across that guy. Like, you know, there's always some dickhead. You know what I mean? That you kind of have to put up with. Like, you know, it's just like, oh, what can you do? Um, like, you know, see that Ty Alliance? Like, you know, what what the fuck was that about? Near 30k points playing against a third of that, and then they all get salty over some war Warhound Titans? That doesn't even bring them up to speed. That's nowhere near them Warhound Titans. Do not bring them up to speed. That's amazingly good playing. Tactical genius on Creed! You know, 
But, uh, like, you know, I wouldn't, like, you know, that was just a good game, to be honest with you. It sounded like a lot of fun. I really enjoyed them. I've played a few Apocalypse games, um, because I've got about 10k of older altogether. I'm not even taking the piss, it's really bad. But, um, I've had a few of them sorts of games in there. A lot of fun. I really enjoy them. Like, you know, let us know if you've had any as well. And, like, you know, if you've ever come across that guy before, you know, why is it so common? It's actually annoying just how common it is. But, uh, hey, also, uh, I'm going to be putting up a poll, um, if you haven't seen it by the time this video's up, um, about, like, you know, so the videos in the background, the Dawn of War gameplay is from the live stream the other day, and I kind of want to do more live streams, I want to do more of that, like, you know, interact with you. So, uh, I'm going to throw up, like, you know, what games maybe we can play next. I'll t I, like, you know, I want to get something where as many people as possible can play. And, like, you know, we can rotate three people. I think it would be a lot of fun. But I'm going to be doing them on Highwavia, my second channel. Because I finally figured out how to have multiple live streams all going at the same time. So, that's pretty cool. So, uh, definitely go ahead and check out Highwavia to, like, you know, stay up to speed with all that. Um, don't worry, if you're in the Discord you'll know what's happening way ahead in advance. You know what I mean? Just be online at the time, get your headset, and as long as you've got the game, you know what I mean? I think it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy playing with you guys. So uh, maybe we should start, like, you know, like a Steam clip. That could be pretty cool. Maybe something like that we should get together. I don't know. I don't know. Something to look into. Um, but no, um, have you ever, as I say, have you ever had any horror stories? Like, you know, I'm sure we all have. Like, you know, um, it, it is more common than what I'd like to admit. But what can you do? I suppose, like, you know, at least these guys knew how to handle them. Like, you know, I wish I could handle them like that, but, oh well. Um, but hey, uh, check out all the links below, and I'll see you in the next video. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back and it's way down heavy on me and it's not okay can you help a nigga out and just stop this